Thanks so much, Catherine, and the team here for getting together what I think is a pretty amazing audience. Uh, it's growing by the minute, so if you can hear the pings, every new ping is someone else joining the conversation today. So just by way of introductions, I'm going to ask our guests in the moment to introduce themselves a little bit about why they're here, who they are, and why they care about this agenda as much as I do. I'm Jacqueline Davis. I'm the National Director for Leadership, Lifelong Learning and Talent in the NHS. I'm here just over a year now, and uh, part of my portfolio is the NHS Leadership Academy. And you will know, if you know anything about the NHS Leadership Academy, we care about giving line managers the support they do to do the things that matters. And certainly in terms of creating a culture around freedom to speak up, and creating a culture where our guardians can thrive and flourish. Indeed, actually, we would say that being a guardian is a good a sign of leadership in and of itself. And actually, we should look to our pool of national guardians around the place for our next generation of leaders. So this is why we care about it. But we think actually that um, after all the noise has died down in the launch of a scheme, this is a really conversation about where we go next. How do we keep the momentum going? How do we keep the energy up? How do we make sure this maintains um, its kind of top priority on people's to-do list? And that's really what we're going to talk about today under the theme of follow-up. But I'd just like to introduce our guests, Elizabeth and also Angie. And tell, can you tell us a little bit about um, your background, why you're here today and why this matters for you? Elizabeth, let's start with you. Thank you, Jacqueline. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon uh, just to share my my views and experiences on this subject matter. I am the Chief People Officer at Surrey and Sussex NHS uh, Trust and uh, by virtue of uh, the job that I do, it, it comes without saying it is a given that I'm extremely passionate about ensuring that we've got a workplace environment that allows all staff to thrive. And, and speaking up is at the center of that. And uh, I see it as my duty, my responsibility, and just the right thing to do by each other as part of our shared humanity to ensure that we are all working in a culture and an environment that allows us to speak up, not only for the sake of each other as colleagues at the place of work, but also to ensure that our patient gets the very, very best of care they can possibly get in our environment. So I'm really, really delighted to join you this afternoon to share views. Thank you, Jacqueline. Lovely to see you again, Elizabeth. Thank you. And, and Angie, um, tell us a little bit about your role and also why you care about this agenda. Thanks, Jacqueline, and thanks, Elizabeth. Really inspiring start. I'll try and follow that. Um, I'm Chief Exec at Chesterfield Royal. I've been here just over two years. Um, a nurse by background, worked in the NHS for 35 years now. Um, and like my colleagues, believe passionately that um, everyone should be able to speak up around their concerns and also the good things that are happening in their world. Um, happy staff makes happy patients. Uh, and that's my philosophy. We've been on a journey at Chesterfield Royal when I arrived. Um, I think it's fair to say there was a, a good groundwork around freedom to speak up, but um, still lots to do. Abby, my guardian, started a month before I did, so we're, we're on the journey together. Um, both believe uh, very passionately about what we're doing and, and how we can sustain. I think, Jacqueline, that's a really good point. Um, and the other observation, I'd make is that um, the awful experience that uh, patients had that triggered freedom to speak up is um, something for me that we need to shift now to be freedom to speak up being about those positive things, not just about people speaking up when they've got concerns. So that's um, where, where we're on, on our journey at the moment and, and happy to talk um, shortly around some of the practical steps we're taking. Thank you. Lovely. Well, welcome both. And so just so everybody's in the picture, what we are going to talk about today is, you know, really getting underneath what are the ingredients of a really successful scheme? What when we look back on where we started, um, do we think made the difference? What would we do a little bit differently now with a with a good um, sense of hindsight? And then actually we're going to move forward in this conversation and talk about how do we keep that energy going? And really what we'd like to leave everyone with today is a series of sort of practical um, hints and tips 
actually that you can take away and mobilize in your organizations um, with your with the other with other guardians um, but also mainly with your leaders really because we know don't we that leaders have a lot on their plate at the moment we know that leaders are um, pretty kind of um, short on time at the moment short on bandwidth um, so, so one of the kind of key things I'd like us to get to as we talk in this conversation is, you know, what are the, as I say, what are the kind of hints and tips that we can take away to give our leaders to make sure their eye is still on the ball, they still continue to keep um, focused on creating the right culture, the right environment. And so that as we go through what I know is going to be a very challenging winter for everyone in the service, that we actually don't take our eye off this really important ball. So that's where we're going in terms of the whole conversation today. I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start back with Angie, actually. And so say when you look back on your scheme, obviously you've been enrolled two years. We, any reflections on what's worked well, things you might do differently? I think what's worked well is that message from um, the very top without being hierarchical. Everyone has a leadership role in their organisation. Um, but as chief exec, I set the tone for the organisation and my board colleagues with me um, reiterate that tone and that message. So us being very committed to freedom to speak up and what it means, um, I think is something that's worked well. Um, I think being honest and open, which are always words easy to say, and we don't always necessarily um, feel able to do in the NHS. Um, we do have some really challenging um, days, uh, but actually recognising those and saying it's okay not to be okay. Um, we don't always get it right for every patient every time, but how do we keep reiterating that support to, to recognise that? Um, and at the same time as leaders keep positive, um, and that's a really important bit that sometimes um, what would I do differently is how do we um, support everyone to find that balance between that honesty, openness, listening to what are often difficult conversations, um, but keeping keeping the positivity as leaders um, and happy to explain a bit further around some of the work we're doing, particularly for our managers and leaders in the organisation um, and some of the learning we've done that is helping build that. Thank you. We'll come back to that in a moment, actually. Now, can I just ask you, is there anything? So I'm, I'm a big fan, being in lifelong learning, of the idea of leadership reflexivity, that we can actually look back at things and think, actually, if we were going to do that again, um, might we do it a little bit differently? Any reflections from you, you know, kind of when you look back about things that, you know, by way of a hint or a tip, people hear that maybe you would single out as being really important or you might have done them differently? Lots. Um, the, probably the one that comes to mind is how I've seen this role um, being more about how we do things around here rather than something that you have to think about and something that is seen as um, often quite negative. So my recent few weeks and months, I've put much more of a this is just what we do. And I, I started off saying I wanted Abby and myself to be out of a job in a couple of years time when we've um, done everything that we needed to do. I've stopped saying that now um, because actually I was focusing on everybody being able to speak up to the line manager so they didn't need to speak to Abby or to me because they felt able to do that um, and actually in life you maybe want someone to talk to different to your line manager um, and that isn't necessarily because you can't talk to them but you just want to sound ideas around or, or just want a different perspective or feel a bit anxious about making yourself look a bit daft in front of your box. Um, so actually how I put a bit more of that positivity rather than um, that slight sinking feeling sometimes you get when you think oh, um, it's a freedom to speak up issue. Thanks very much for your candour Andy. Thank you. We're going to come now to Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, listening Angie set the um, scene there in terms of you know kind of what what worked well what knowing what she knows now um, she might sort of dial up or slightly kind of nuance differently how does this look from your point of view I'm conscious you're very new in your role so um, tell us about your experience of launching schemes around freedom to speak up and how you keep them going 
Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, yes, I'm new to my substantive role as the Chief People Officer at Surrey and Sussex, uh, barely two months in right now. But the whole agenda of freedom to speak up is one that I've lived with within the NHS. I was in the NHS when it was introduced and uh, I can share my experiences from a leadership point of view. I think the big thing, uh, like we, we all did at the time, and um, up and down the country, we all went and recruited these people and gave them the job title and you, uh, the freedom to speak up uh, guardian in the organization. I think looking back to when this, uh, the initiative was new to now, two things stand out for me. For this to work and for this to be driven forward differently, we as leaders need to demonstrate actively so that we have listened to what has been raised and we've done something about it. Even if that something about it is that we can do nothing at this particular time because people get extremely disheartened when they make time and they get or they feel it, the word brave doesn't feel right, but if they make that time to speak up and share their experiences or just share what is uh, of concern to them and then wait with the expectation that something is going to happen and nothing happens. We don't even go back to saying, by the way, I raised this at this forum and, and they're either thinking about it or there's nothing they can do about it. I think we leaders need to re inject that energy across our organization by committing to closing that loop, going back to our colleagues and saying, we have heard what you said and therefore X, Y and Z. Uh, that's a really, really important thing for us as leaders to do in driving this agenda forward. The second thing we need to do, and I have learned this through experience, is the role modeling element of it when it comes to freedom to speak up. Um, I found out, you know, um, through some challenges and others, as a leader, you are under immense scrutiny, day in, day out, and rightly so, for what you say, and what you do not say for what you do and what you don't do. So it's incumbent upon us as leaders to be aware of this and to ensure that we are role modeling accordingly by actively calling out what we feel is not right, by, by we as leaders also speaking out, because we too need to speak out when we see things are not right for our patients, when things are not right for our colleagues, uh, we have that duty to speak up as well. So we just need to be aware that the whole organization and people around us are observing us, are watching us, and what we do or don't do has a huge impact on how the rest of our colleagues around us behave. So those are the two things that I keep reminding myself every day as a leader that are critical to this agenda in driving it forward. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, and I think you just really neatly summarised the kind of ingredients of success there between the two of you. I'll just summarise what I heard, actually. So really important to have positive and committed senior leadership. Um, and that, you know, what I heard you say, Angie, was about making the time to listen and also making the space um, for people to come and tell you, um, you know, what you need to hear. I think that's really important. I think sometimes it's really hard to access senior leaders, isn't it? It's hard to know how to access. It's hard to actually get time in the diary. So actually carving out the time in the diary, really, really important. Elizabeth, your point about communication. I think sometimes we 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 make some assumptions about communication, don't we? We assume it just happens. Yeah, but a couple of things I'm pulling out from both of your stories there that actually communication tonally, and I think the point about tone, Angie, is really well made about um, some of the stuff that you are going to welcome hearing is going to be uncomfortable stuff. And yet we need to welcome the uncomfortable stuff with a degree of constructive positivity. OK, because we need to feel, you know, as leaders that we can do something about this. There needs to be action, as Elizabeth said, taken as a result of this. And of course, that communication needs to be two way. We might come in a moment. I might come and ask you about how you've kind of made communication work well, because I think there is still my, my observation is there's still just an assumption that it just happens. Yeah, good communication. But I think it really does need um, TLC, as Elizabeth has said. And then this whole point about not just the CEO, because, you know, I get already that if you're a CEO, you know how important um, your reaction, your visibility, your scrutiny is as a role model, but also how all leaders uh, role model this. I think this is another point I'd like to come back to. 
Let's just quickly touch on communication again. So a question for you both. How do you make communication happen well? Yeah, how do you make communication happen well on an ongoing basis? Angie, do you want to lead off with that? So do you want me to kick off? Um, so I think firstly, by recognising that um, no one way suits everyone all the time. And even as an individual, you may want um, to be communicated with one day to day. It may not suit the way you want to be communicated with tomorrow. So that constant reflection and asking the question about what's working well, what isn't, and making sure you're using all the tools in the books because you can never I say, do it all. Um, I think a reflection for me uh, during the pandemic, I, I started six months um, before we went into lockdown. Um, so I felt quite lucky that I had six months of getting out and about around the organisation. I did drop-in sessions, I did coffee mornings, so staff could just come and talk to me. Um, and it still really strikes me that even now people say, well, you're quite normal for a chief exec. Um, so that, that bit about how I make talking to me and all leaders in the organisation normal and easy, um, using different ways of doing it. And then when the pandemic struck, my, my preference is getting out there talking to everybody, thinking how am I going to do this and how are, are Abby and I going to keep those conversations going. Um, thinking about how we use social media. We were just talking earlier about our, our um, Twitter campaign at the moment. Um, it took me ages to get Abby on Twitter, she went around me saying so. Um, but just to actually think differently about how we communicate again and, and the power I'm still really surprised about how many people read my blog or see my tweets. I forget sometimes that, um, as you say, when you're in that those senior positions, people do actually um, take notice of what you say. So just thinking about all those different ways about how we communicate. Um, and lastly, the most important bit of communicating is that listening, uh, as you emphasised earlier, Jacqueline, and, um, and, and accepting, as, they, as we both said, we can't always get it right, we can't always fix everything, um, but at least we can listen. Um, so that I'll hand over to Elizabeth now to build on that. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. So building on that, um, how do you keep the communication working effectively from your perspective? So I agree with what you've shared there, Angie. You've got to use a, a multiple of sources to engage with people, to communicate with them. Uh, but if I narrow it down to the, the subject we're discussing today, and uh, uh, in my experience, issues that are raised through the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian uh, don't tend to come in, in hundreds or thousands. Um, you, you will find maybe, maybe it varies, 10, 15 in a month, or maybe less than that. I have found that reaching out in person to those colleagues, reaching out in person to acknowledge, to say, thank you, you raised this, tell me more about it, or you raised this, how does it feel now? How is it going for you? Is just invaluable. So uh, I don't always succeed, but I do make the time to physically go and find those people and just in person to say, how is it going for you? Just thank you very much for raising it. And do you know this is what we've done about it or we can't do anything about it right now, but how are you coping with it? What could make it slightly differently for you? It's a powerful way of communicating to our colleagues around this agenda and uh, the word gets out. You, they both had to come and see hello. They both had to find out how it is going. So where, whenever possible, make time for that. It's not easy because there are days you're in Teams meetings from seven o'clock until six o'clock. But even if it is a few days later, a few weeks later, people always remember that and it's a powerful way, way of communicating. That's really helpful. And what I'm getting from both of you is communication shouldn't be just left to um, an approach by a guardian or by an incident or a trigger. Actually, what I'm hearing is it needs to be routine. There needs to be rhythms. You need to try um, a whole range of different channels. That ranges from kind of town halls, drop ins, newsletters, Twitter, you know, other other forms of kind of two way exchange and, and everything in between. But you make, make it routine. Make sure you advertise it. And also, Elizabeth, from your point, ask a range of questions. Because sometimes you might, you know, just by changing your question, you might get a whole load of more useful intelligence. It's really important. 
in this story. Now I'm keeping my eye on the chat box and there's one really good question that relates to what we've been talking about, I think which takes us from communication into broader culture. There's a question from Rachel Clark who's working on um, the Freedom to Speak Up initiatives and culture at NHS e &I. And Rachel's asking us the question about what other elements of culture do you think um, really matter? So yeah, we've talked about communication and we've talked about leadership role modelling. What other levers can you pull in culture to start to create a healthy speaking up environment? And I'm going to start this with um, Elizabeth and then move to Angie. So Elizabeth, culture, what, what other areas would you kind of get into? So I have learned, Jacqueline, that culture means a million things to different people. So I'll take it from my point of view, which is a culture in terms of the workplace environment, what your experiences every day is and how that uh, has an impact on, on, on freedom to speak up or allowing people to, to raise concerns when they come. And for me, Jacqueline, it goes back to, to leadership. It goes back to, and when I say leadership, leadership in its broadest sense, Leadership from the point of view of that line manager, that supervisor, that one person who is working with a group of people in that team, uh, who we look to as the leader of that team, you know, irrespective of where they sit within the hierarchy of the organization. If the person who is in charge or responsible or working with a, a group of colleagues, um, their way, their approach to communicating with colleagues, their behavior with colleagues in that little team, has a huge impact on how people can, or on, on speaking up. It has a huge impact on what people can do in that environment or cannot do in that on, an environment. And that for me is what I'm referring here to as the leadership. It's how they say good morning to you when you come into work or not say it. It's how they say thank you at the end of the day or not. It's how they handle that little, little request of my chair is broken, Do, can I get another one or not? It's those very simple everyday issues that determine for colleagues in that little work environment what they can do or don't do, or the concerns, uh, whether they raise a concern or don't raise a concern. So for me, that is what leadership, I think we need to focus on the leadership and we need to check with our leaders uh, whatever level right across the organization, that they understand their impact on those colleagues they're responsible for or working with around in their own little environment. And that is an area of focus for me. That's where I think it begins and ends. And that's our, you know, uh, the impact we have on our patients, the impact we have on our work colleagues. That's my retention. That's our, our care quality. That's our patient experience. It begins at that little level. So for me, when we talk about culture, it's about what is our leadership doing every day in their place of work, including me and my behaviours and the impact that is having on those around me. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. So, Angie, no pressure then. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so, I think uh, to, to give some practical examples of that, because um, you've summed it up really well, um, we have a, a programme called Leading the Chesterfield Way. So, every leader um, that starts in the organisation um, does the three workshops that is about how you lead, the, the what you do, the how you say good morning. Um, and so, how we encourage everyone to see the values that we believe in uh, translating is part of setting the tone again for everybody in, in when you start in the organisation. Um, the other bit then to hone in on freedom to speak up, um, another area that I would do differently um, if I could start again two years ago was really with Abby and um, support on how we get managers to see that this is a really positive thing um, and not something to run away from. Um, so freedom to speak up, being part of the way you do things around here, leading the Chesterfield way, means that if some of your staff are speaking up, what has been fed back to Abby and I is that some managers felt they had no right of reply. So they saw it very much as a criticism of their leadership and that they were being listened to either. So what um, Abby's uh, been doing and I've been supporting it with partly is giving the responsibility and accountability back to the person speaking up to go talk to their manager and involve and engage them rather than it being um, Abby or, or myself trying to address it through another route. Um, and we've seen that more and more people 
uh, almost getting on and trying to have the conversations themselves rather than using Abby as the person to speak up for them, um, which is, is a real positive, but it's taken a lot of work and energy. Um, and then doing training sessions with, with our managers um, to say, this is what it means and this is how maybe we can support you with some of the tools to, to not be afraid when you've got some of your team speaking up. Um, and uh, one of our team, I did check whether she was okay for me to use this example, um, a manager who uh, at one point wanted to resign because she was at the end of a tether with people using freedom to speak up of their way she perceived as criticising and not, not wanting to do what she saw as being important for her patients and her team. Um, and her and Abby had a light bulb moment very recently where fortunately they both decided they weren't going to jeopardy. Um, because they actually saw the, the benefit of working together and working with the team uh, uh, to actually look at the practical things and see, as we say about patient complaints, they are gems, we learn from them, we don't want them to happen, but they're a really good learning tool. It's the same principle for freedom to speak up, which I say unfortunately at the moment seems to be very much it's when it's a negative thing, but actually if you work with managers and support them to say, well, how can we learn from this? How can you do the listening differently? And that manager now has got um, two people in her own area volunteering to be FTSE champions. So has almost come full circle um, and actually presented with Abby and I at our um, finalist presentation to the HSJ Awards for, um, for freedom to speak up. So a complete about turn, uh, but it's taken a lot of work to support her as a manager in the organisation. And the last thing I'd say is Abby's done a fabulous job of um, promoting freedom to speak up in itself, but also linking it in with other work we're doing in the organisation around culture. Um, so we have a lot of work to do around um, race, um, inclusion, um, and so she's working with our Royal Cultural Community and our, our belonging and inclusion group to actually promote um, their work and do it jointly with them. So it was Abby that organised our um, celebration day for our international nurses recently. And she's also doing a lot of work with our health and wellbeing lead. So particularly that learning from some of the things that um, people spoke up to her about during the pandemic was about that health and wellbeing support that they needed. Um, so again, I'm really lucky I've got a fabulous health and wellbeing lead. So Andy and Abby are seen in tandem now going out to areas um, and team meetings to do how can we support you proactively um, rather than waiting for that um, reactive, I, I'm not feeling safe in my workplace uh, conversation. Thank you both. And I think um, I think there's a lot of gems in those stories there. One of the big ones I'm taking away is the importance of linking in with line manager management education and leadership development, because what we're essentially talking about here is creating a culture which is free from fear. Yeah. So as a line manager, um, you've got to learn to address really a couple of key questions. The first one, which is yeah, how do you deal with failure? as a line manager, when you see something go wrong, how do you deal with something going wrong? Yeah, um, how do you kind of address it head on? How do you make sure there's action taken? But also, how do you make sure that you've got to be really careful about not playing the blame game? Yeah, so at the same time as addressing um, failure and being clear about accountability and dealing with performance issues, you've got to be very careful not to tip over into a fear, fear culture because other people will read that you know, kind of, and, and we'll kind of actually read it across into thinking about raising issues with you. So how you deal with failure, how you deal with um, underperformance is a really important thing to think about as a line manager. Also, similarly, what successes do you choose to celebrate? Yeah, every manager has a choice about how they point to the culture that they want to move to. And typically employees read that through how you deal with failure and how you deal with success. And so what you choose to focus on being healthy and successful might not always be rah-rah or celebratory. What are you doing to move this culture one step closer to becoming a healthy culture? I know obviously fundamentally in a line management setting underneath this, how are you um, enabling people to trust you? And the fundamental guidance we always give is a bit like you just said, uh, Elizabeth, is, um, you know, how do you land with people? Are people going to trust you? Are you authentic? So, Angie, when people were saying to you, you're not like 
expect a chief executive to be. I'd say that's a good thing because what it means is people can cut through the layers and understand you on a human basis. And the other thing that's a feature of, I think, a healthy freedom to speak up culture in this space is we're, we're very much adult to adult. Yeah. So, you know, kind of in the world where you've got a command and control world where people are telling people what to do or telling people off, that's when things get hidden. That's when things get pushed under the carpet. That's when people fear they can't make change happen. So kind of addressing people on a human basis, uh, leveling with people, being yourself uh, and being, you know, kind of a, just the final thing I'll say about leadership on this is a kind of understanding that actually you're a work in progress. So I think a lot of leaders get hung up on the idea that they have to be perfect. And actually by being a little bit more imperfect, but being a lot more authentic, I think is a really kind of important step to take to a healthy culture for people feeling free to speak up. But of course, the thing I want to come back to is a great question in the chat box from Lorraine Heaton um, at Liverpool University Hospitals, talking about the barriers to closing the follow up loop. So, Lorraine, what I'm reading for this is that, you know, kind of sometimes people, you know, you've got the culture going well, you've got the guardians performing effectively and you've got the CEOs and the senior leaders listening. But then it's about how we get to action. Yeah. So, um, so. Elizabeth, how, how do we stop the barriers to action? So everything's going well and now we need to make the change happen. So what, what barriers have you seen over the years and how have you resolved them? Uh, I think for me, one of the key things or the key ways where, you know, we, we end up having barriers is where we've got this wonderful report and we, we, we document all the issues raised and the actions that should be taken. And we are never really good at, you know, identifying a key person to lead on it or even where we've identified a key person to lead on that action. We stop there. We don't come back to say, and how about next month we check that that action has really been closed and that it really, really happened. So we are very good at stopping us. Yes, this has happened. This is what we need to do. Uh, Elizabeth, you will be leading on doing this. And we stop there. We don't come back to, and did it really happen? Do we, do we check back on ourselves to see, and did, was that action really, really closed? So that is one thing that's within our gift that we can uh, easily change. And it's one of the things I'm learning to put into place. And the second one, um, which I don't know whether to call it a barrier. Yes, it is a barrier. Some of the issues that are raised require resources, including financial resources, uh, to, to, to make the change. Um, we, we know up and down the country, some of our NHS organizations are set up in really old estate. And we know that with COVID landing, we had to do things differently, including some level of social distancing, even in our little sort of staff rooms, staff areas where they go to rest. Now, that is something that cannot be changed overnight because of the nature of the state and the capital funding and all those things that go with it. Uh, and the difficulty comes in where we we struggle with and we are getting better at this to go back and say, do you know what, Jacqueline, that is one we are not going to solve, not today, not tomorrow, maybe not even in the next one year. We just can't solve that one. So some of it could be beyond our immediate um, immediate gift to resolve. And, and what could what we. at is going back and sort of you know communicating the challenges surrounding the, uh, why we cannot uh, solve some of those issues so as not to leave our staff our staff feeling they just don't care they just don't want to deal with this so some of it could be resources but communication helps in in those cases uh, and there are some really tough cases whereby there's just no capital funding or there's just no financial leeway at the moment to deal with it um, and, and also the going back in person, you know, to remove some of those barriers. We just need as leaders to take that responsibility and to, to physically make that time to be visible and just go back and say, meet with those people and tell them what we have done. And, and that, that is something we just need to get better at. So those two things are the ones I've encountered recently, and I just feel we can do something about it and to follow through and close the loop. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Angie, closing the loop from your perspective, um, what barriers have you experienced and how have you got over them? Thanks Jacqueline and I just need to say hello to Lorraine. I hope you're well. We used to work together in um, Liverpool, so thanks for the question. Um, and I, I'd use communication again as, as uh, that barrier 
Uh, so we were reflecting recently around um, how do we know? So every month, Abby and I sit down and go through um, uh, her, her list. Um, how do we know we're shifting and making a change? And how do we know we're making a change for patients? Because that's what we're all here for at the end of the day. Um, and I think sometimes in the ambition to change the culture and change the whole world, we forget to remember and acknowledge those changes we have made. Um, so um, raised toilet seats, I won't go into detail, but you know we've made a difference because someone spoke up in an area, not necessarily about that, but an action, they felt empowered to talk about getting some resource differently for raised toilet seats. So you know that, that is a tick that's made a difference to patients and remembering how we communicate that right through to we have made a, a big decision as an organisation recently that supports my mission that we are and uh, will be one day um, a non-discriminatory organisation and I, I'm struggling as to how I communicate that without breaching confidentiality so we're just reflecting on how do we get the messages across that when people do uh, raise issues we're learning whether they be as small as a toilet seat to a big decision around um, racism um, and how do we communicate that that back to people um, so any thoughts and suggestions about how that how we get that message there and the other one I think Elizabeth went on I know she picked up on it earlier but the one where I know there's ones where people have said oh well there's no point in um, speaking up because nothing ever happens I know something did happen um, but actually it wasn't what that person wanted um, so how do you get people to understand that just by speaking up doesn't mean to say you get exactly what you want or you get anything because sometimes whether it's resources or other reasons we can't always address the issue straight away that they're raising. Thank you both. I think this, the thing that I'm taking away from that and I, I want to kind of play it back as I still live as a relative newcomer to the NHS um is that you know the importance of actually treating this like a proper change program and so making sure that the actions are recorded making sure that they're risk assessed making sure they've got accountabilities and time frames around them you know one to make sure that very practically uh, you're keeping the to-do list updated and following through and practically also you've got a record there in terms of progress and achievements and potentially, and this is going to take me back to my other point, uh, potentially some strategic risks that you need to keep an eye on as well as a very senior leader. You know, kind of sometimes some of these small conversations are part of something much, much more important, something larger that needs a more systemic approach to or, or a more strategic approach to sort of bring it together. So if you haven't already, some of the organisations that I've seen who are doing this well are kind of incorporating it into a sort of programme management methodology and also put, uh, incorporating it into risk management. So if you sit on a board, for example, you're know, kind of looking over the whole organisation thinking, how does freedom to speak up activities feature on our corporate risk log? Angie, does that ring a bell with you? Yeah, sorry, I was just, I'm just going to uh, come back. It's a really good um, way of framing it. And I'm thinking, well, we do do that. So our BAF quite clearly reflects um, all the discussions we've been having. Um, and that is biannual report to the board does. And every month at board, um, we have a, a people and staff experience report that when you triangulate it with the conversations that Abby and I have, there are targeted areas that have a exec sponsors because we know there are particular concerns there and the exec directors support the teams to follow through on those actions. But I'm just sat listening to you now, Jacqueline, thinking we, we don't sort of collate that from a, a programme management point of view, but maybe with a bit of support and strength, Abby, um, she's got a task now for next week's catch up, so thank you. Definitely links into strategic risk management, and uh, and also of course it would be remiss for me not to say this. Of course, um, other tools for listening, like the staff survey, which is around at the moment. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to say anything about that in terms of other tools for closing the the gap, closing the loop? Uh, I think uh, the BAF is the I mean the board assurance framework where we take all the strategic risks. Uh, it, it's a key one, uh, Jacqueline, but that's a key one for the senior leaders within the organization. 
Um, I remember when I was in a more junior role within the NHS, I, I, I had no clue what the buff was. I had no idea. You, you don't even have an understanding that, uh, you know, strategic risks are collected somewhere, or collated somewhere. Um, so that is good for sort of the senior leadership team, the board. Um, I think for me, where, where it makes a huge, and, and most of us do that anyway, where it makes a huge difference is that closing the loop with our colleagues who've raised the issues and for them to really understand and know that as leaders of the organization, we have therefore done something about it. And that's the area I think I need to work really hard on with my fellow colleagues to ensure that that person who raised that issue down there uh, feels their voice was heard and they've seen a difference or we've just gone back to say we can't do something. That's really important to me because we need to keep those sources of information coming. We need to, uh, because it's a learned experience. If I raise something today and I see something has been done about it, then I get more emboldened and I know that tomorrow, if I see something that needs to be escalated or raised, I will raise it knowing they are going to pay attention and do something about it. So for me very much is more closing the loop with our colleagues who share, who make the time to share the issues with us, even as we, we enter it on our bath and all this, uh, the risk registers that we have. Uh, that's that's really, really important to me. And I think that's, that's where I need to put more effort here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Now, one of the key parts of following up, I would say, is the um, tenacity of your guardian. Yeah, so having a guardian who's um, a terrier, having a guardian who's incredibly resilient, um, and having a guardian who is um, influential, persuasive, all of those things. We ask a lot of our guardians, I think. Um, and I said earlier that I think the guardians are... Um, actually, uh, you know, leader, uh, you know, kind of a demonstrating leadership presence and potential in and of themselves just by putting their hands up and taking on this really crucial role. What would be your observations about um, what makes a good guardian um, work effectively and any kind of observation, not just for the individuals themselves, but also about for what we need to do as leaders to enable them to work effectively? I'll give you a little moment for pause there. And just while we think we're just coming into the final 15 minutes, everyone, um, it's fantastic to have you on the session. If you have any burning questions, now's the time to put them in the chat box uh, for us to have a look at. Uh, we've only got time for sort of two or three more questions. So if you put them in now, um, just while Elizabeth and Angie kind of mull over the question about effective guardians, uh, we'll hopefully find some time to get them all in. Thank you. So, um, Elizabeth, what makes an effective guardian and what do you do as a senior leader to help them be effective? I'll answer this based on my experience of, of working with Freedom to Speak Up Guardians. What makes a good guardian is resilience. Um, and I say that uh, because um, I have worked, uh, and this is going back a few years, I've worked with the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian who had no set forum, no set structures in place to support their work. And, and, and they kept going and they kept raising the same issue and they kept presenting it in a way that would make the difference for the patients and for the staff in a way that, you know, I need a system to capture and collate all these issues. I need a forum. I need to be heard. At, at that time, they didn't have a voice to the board or they went through the second and third and the fourth person before uh, the issues could get raised at board level. They didn't have that direct access. But what kept them going was resilience. I'll keep positioning it this way and next quarter I'll still say it this way and that way and and a year and a half later finally they were told twice in a year you could go to the board yourself but they made headway so resilience is 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 one of those qualities or characteristics that in my view and based on my experience makes a really good guardian because it's not always easy for them uh, there are some organizations with very well developed uh, supportive meeting structure and infrastructure for them and there are some where it is not so well developed and it takes somebody to keep going to get there and for us as leaders uh, we just need to do our leadership role of enabling. It's, it's upon us to enable those roles to function well, to support accordingly, to finance where required in terms of systems and other, to open up those meeting avenues for them and meeting structures, and to present them to do their work as they should. That's how I'd respond to that, Jacqueline. 
Thanks, Elizabeth. Nice one. Angie, what, what would you add to that? It's always hard to go second, isn't it? You keep passing the baton, Elizabeth. But, um, uh, all of that. Um, empathy and listening um, may seem obvious, but actually someone that does actively listen. And I think working alongside, so uh, the comment again about being normal, but having um, Abby's a nurse, uh, she only does one shift now in A&E, times the other thing, so we keep increasing her hours. Um, while trying to keep their clinical uh, commitment. Um, but it being someone that people see does listen, does empathise and understands what it's like to be um, at the front line. Uh, not that I don't think I don't understand, but actually having someone that is that bridge sometimes um, translates. Um, what do I do and what do my colleagues do to support Abby? Um, how could keep a sense of humour? Because it is a tough job and you do tend to get a lot of the negative. Um, and hence our green treats box this week. Um, so uh, how do we, how do I keep her energy um, going and her focus when uh, it feels like so a lot of it is, is negative? Um, I offered her some coaching support, the same as I do all my exec um, directors, um, so that she's got that support for herself. I think as guardians, you have a tendency to want to look after everyone else and fix everything for everyone else where actually if you're not looking after yourself and getting support to um, see that you can't fix everything then that, that doesn't help um, any of your, your um, people that are speaking up to you so that's what I'm um, hopefully doing for, for Abby to support her. Some really wise words there, um, really wise words particularly around this sense of how do we enable resilience and I get a real sense that the most effective guardians are the ones with the most effective partnerships with their senior leaders. And so the senior leaders need to kind of keep an eye on the well-being of our guardians, but also to do some support and enabling um, in terms of how to influence across the organisation, particularly at senior levels. We're really conscious. I mean, there's some fantastic training material in the National Guardian uh, Guardian's office and with the partnership of HEE on this in terms of, if you like, how to be an effective guardian. But you can't get away from the fact, can you? What I'm hearing from you both is it's got to be a partnership, probably a three way partnership, actually, between the guardian, the CEO and the chief people officer, um, making sure the guardian kind of understands how the system works, making sure that there's um, time in the system, both for the listening, but also for the follow up. I think a really crucial piece as well is just looking after their well-being, understanding that guardians are essentially kind of lightning rods for a lot of difficult or uncomfortable or kind of highly emotional issues and kind of how are we looking after the guardians to make sure that they have got the resilience they need to keep going and do what is essentially a really critical job. So very important comments there. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask Catherine, I just I don't know whether it's the bandwidth issue in terms of um, the work today, whether people are just um, enjoying listening to the conversation. I don't think I can hear any more um, questions in the chat box. No, I, I think you're you're right, Jacqueline. It's just been such an inspirational and so much food food for thought. It's easy for me to say. Um, but there there is a comment here really about um, inclusion and 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 linking all of this into inclusion and, and the interconnectivity. I don't know if there's time to answer that very big I, question. I thank you for pulling that out because actually if we have got time and I think it's maybe something we'll end with, but I think there's a huge conversation that needs to happen about, you know, kind of where we might end with this, but I think it's probably another session. And I'm saying this very conscious that we're in the middle of Black History Month, we're in the middle of um, a big conversation around race ahead. And and kind of where I would start with this, and just to give you a heads up for your, for your thoughts in a moment both, is that we've got to kind of understand that the culture that we're talking about is full of different privileges, yeah? And so the idea of creating a healthy culture what might be healthy for some groups of staff might still feel incredibly unhealthy for others. So we know from what our BAME colleagues tell us about their lived experience around the small microaggressions, you know, going back to getting names right, um, being listened to, you know, kind of being supported, um, how we allow and enable all of the wonderful differences in our teams to come into the workplace. Um, is uh, equally important in terms of creating a healthy culture. So some kind of closing words from you both really about the lens of inclusion on um, freedom to speak up and healthy cultures. 
Angie, I'll go to you first and then Elizabeth, we'll, we'll close with you. Thank you and, and love the race ahead um, conversation on Tuesday. I was slightly um, anxious afterwards that I realised you've gone from um, having David speak to, to me. Um, but we've got Elizabeth, so um, fabulous to, um, to have eminent speakers uh, uh, this week and, and listening to everybody. And, and thank you for the comments in the chat box. It's, it's just great that, that we're talking about um, all these things for starters, because unfortunately, in some parts of my organisation, I know that people don't feel comfortable talking about freedom to speak up or, or inclusion. Um, and thank you, Jacqueline, for the reminder that Zoe, my director of um, HR and OD, would never forgive me if I didn't um, reference her as well. But she's done a fabulous role supporting Abby um, around belonging and inclusion sessions. Um, and when I said earlier we've got a long way to go in Chesterfield, we've got a long way to go um, as a woman or a, 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 a person of non-white um, colour, then um, you sometimes get some challenges in this organisation, including myself. Um, so how we are working with all our teams, um, with Zoe and Abby, to really um, so start to have the conversations that um, I'm ashamed to say you haven't had in this organisation, um, but definitely need to have. And again, that's recognising that um, we by no means perfect, we don't always get it right. Um, but some really good work, particularly around allyship at the moment, that um, I'm really proud of and, and starting to see that shift. So um, looking forward to much more conversations along that, that line and, and seeing um, it'd be good for us to get back together in another um, year or so, wouldn't it, and see how far we, we can really take that journey. Thanks, Angie. Elizabeth. I'll, I'll, I'll share my views by sharing a real story, uh, a real life experience that happened to me around speaking up. About six male nurse uh, came over to me to say, hello, Elizabeth, you, 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 you guys in HR keep on telling us to speak up. I said, yes, it's important, you know, tell me more. Uh, Band six male nurse, BAME origin. He looked at me and said, I'll tell you why I cannot speak up. I am a band six male nurse. My family is dependent on me, not only my family here in the UK, but my family back home where I come from. So if I risk to speak up and share with you some of the challenges I go through here, I'm at risk of losing my job. If I lose my job, it's not just my wife and two children here who are dependent on it, who will, go, uh, who will be impacted, but my uncle, you know, back home, who is dependent on me to pay school fees for his two children who have now started secondary school. My auntie is very ill. I support their care by sending a few quid back home to support them in, in, you know, financially. So I look around me, I take into account my context, and at the end of the day, it's better not to speak up than to speak up. That's, and, and, and I've never forgotten that story. So when you talk about speaking up and inclusion, especially from the point of view of ethnic minority colleagues who are immigrants in this country who are here because you know we recruited them, international nurses, come over and work for us. You have to think of the broader context. And even I don't know, Jacqueline, how we crack that, but I know it's the reality of their world and what they think about before they speak up. That's my sharing on that subject. Thank you, Elizabeth. And, and I think stories like that really sort of send it home to me about probably there are stories like that in every single organisation represented here today. So I think if I, if I could reflect on this, um, you know, kind of guardians and senior leaders who are on the call, you know, kind of ask yourself these questions. Who's speaking up? Yeah. Who's speaking up? Who's actually holding the mic? Who's holding the floor? And do the people, you know, kind of who are speaking up look like and sound like the people that you're serving in terms of your patients? Yeah, have a think about that. Have a think about, we talked earlier about communication channels and about how Angie was telling us how actually you've got to be a bit experimental with communication channels. Some things will work for different audiences. Okay, have you got the right communication channels where people feel safe to speak up, whether you're getting that broad range of um, voices in the room. Can you make sure that when people are um, speaking up that they can do so candidly but safely, maybe anonymously, 
confidentially how are we building in those checks and balances to get that broad range of voices and also kind of it's, you know, in terms of our well-being guardians you know when we look at our well-being guardians are the pool of our well-being guardians um, looking like um, balanced enough you know the patients that we look after if they're not what do we need to do to make the well-being guardian role um, more attractive more interesting more trusted around different communities and so I think you know kind of particularly if you're sort of start, you know whether you're starting out on a scheme for the first time or whether you're actually upgrading your scheme or reviewing your scheme or thinking about it I think this is a really critical question yeah um, measuring the kind of outcomes of your um, freedom to speak up um, interventions not just through the kind of amount of them or the amount of actions you're able to close on your action log, but the quality of them, the breadth of them, the diversity of the different voices kind of that you're capturing and that you're actioning, I think is, is becoming increasingly a critical measure. And actually, you know, just given that we're in Race Ahead and we're in Black History Month, why not actually ask yourselves the question, could we take an anti-racist stance to um, freedom to speak up? What does taking an anti-racist stance look like here? What does that mean for us? There's some fabulous examples kind of starting to emerge up and down the country, uh, particularly in West Yorkshire and Harrogate ICS, who are doing a massive campaign around rooting out racism at the moment. And they're just demonstrating all the different elements of the system that we can influence and in action to make change happen. So I think that's a really powerful point to close this session on. Really great session, um, panellists. Thank you for your candour. I love the reflexivity in terms of talking about the key ingredients, but also the even better ifs. I love the bit around leadership, around ultimately as senior leaders, it comes down to how you impact your culture, the choices that you make, and particularly the time that you carve out for this, particularly on the follow-up, particularly on removing the barriers. And finally, that final very powerful point around, um, this is a three-way relationship. This is a partnership where it's gonna work really well um, the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian is supported left hand, right hand by the chief exec and by the chief people officer and actually and they look out for each other and they work in, into the wider system well together. That's what I'm hearing from this conversation. It's been fantastic to have Angie on my left hand, Elizabeth on my right hand today. Thank you so much for your insight and wisdom. And Catherine, back over to you to talk about what happens next. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, and and thank you, um, Angie and Elizabeth. There's lots of love in the chat here um, for a really um, thought-provoking session. Um, this recording will be uploaded in, onto our YouTube channel, and we'll be sharing that um, um, on our on our social media. Um, it's Speak Up Month, so do take a look at, at that training. Make a, a Speak Up pledge um, and support um, your guardians and your colleagues um, um, this, for raising awareness about freedom to speak up. It's been a fantastic month so far, and um, this has been um, a brilliant um, um, event. So thank you to all of you and for everyone for joining the session. Thank you. Thank you.